Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. I'm your co-host Scott Patton, and joining me as usual is Martin Patella, health coach at Life Enthusiast. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? Life's good. I'm living the life of a cracked pot. You know, the person who has had a chronic inflammatory disease for years. And so there are great days, medium days, and not the greatest days. So you can you can imagine what life's like. I'm just one of many people who have the genetics. I have the MTHFR mutation and several others. So uh, when uh, I've had many years ago mercury poisoning that took me over the edge and turned me into a, a complete basket case. And uh, because I was educated as a uh, analyst, I have a degree in computer science and uh, business management. At some point, after a while of trying to beat my head against the wall of the medical system and then the alternative healthcare, I decided that I was going to figure it out for myself. It was the, I call it the liminal moment when you say, Either I fix this or I'm out of here. And um, so I said to myself, analyze this. And I, I analyzed it against the, you know, this was back when, before internet, when you actually had to go to the library, buy books and read things on paper with ink, dead trees and and soot on pages. Anyway, so I figured it out, I thought, and uh, fixed myself and then lived a fairly normal life since then. And at some point, about 15 years ago, I decided to start a business that supports people in health. It's called Life Enthusiast. It, uh, it's based around a health coach model where we believe in biological individuality, where we believe that people should be treated not as numbers and they should be individually understood and get the treatment that gets them better. That's about the background on me. Oh, in recent years, I have got myself certified as a metabolic typing advisor, which is a discipline in the palette of functional medicine. And that sets us apart from the symptom-oriented medicine. The mainstream medical system is essentially focused on symptom management. They cannot cure anything because they are not interested in curing anything. They're interested in managing or treatment of symptoms. The functional medicine model asks, and uh, why is a specific symptom occurring? To give an example, uh, you have high blood pressure, a uh, mainstream doctor gives you a pill that um, tries to address the blood pressure specifically and directly. A functional practitioner would ask, why is the blood pressure increased? What's behind that? And tries to address the function at the cellular level rather than at, rather, <laughs> rather than at the presentation at the organ level. So that's why we're different. We're going after fixing the reason why you're sick as opposed to just messing around with the symptoms. We don't uh, go after um, treating the pain or removing the symptom. We go after the reason why this happens. And we have permanent lasting results. Although they're not as easy to attain. It's not an easy button. Like you can't just go push this or take this pill and it's over. It does not work like that. The point I wanted to make was uh, the medical system that we have has a, a purpose. And unfortunately, it's gotten away from the purpose. And that purpose is if you fall out of a tree and you break a leg or break an arm or you have a heart attack or you have a stroke and there's an emergency situation, they are very, very good at saving your life or putting you back together. They take four hours and eight years on nutrition. So when it comes to lifestyle type things, they're not very good. 
And in our, my opinion, anyway, um, we put a lot of pressure on doctors. We say, you know what? You fixed my son's broken arm, did it great. Now I'm obese. Now I have diabetes. Now I'm in pain. Give me something to fix me. And we don't stop harassing them until they do. And the result, of course, is, is that they give you this pill and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, maybe it gives you side effects that are worse. And, and we keep going back to them and back to them and back to them, asking them to do things that aren't really, the, not, it's their job now, they want to do it and everything else. They want to be the gurus of health and to be able to tell you everything. But everywhere you look, we have chronic problems that are spiraling out of control. We have 32,000 people in our group that are constantly telling us and everybody else to listen how much pain they're in. And nobody believes them half the time, right? And the doctors don't because the doctor is very used to, if you have a problem, there's a marker in your blood. So we're going to take out some blood. We're going to do these tests. We're going to find out what's wrong with you. And then once we know what's wrong with you because of what we read in your blood, okay? So, you know, people laugh at people that can look at your eyes and tell you what your problems are, or that they can, you know, do things and tell you what your problems are. Yet we read blood to tell you what your problems are. And half, almost all the time, people with fibromyalgia, there's nothing, there's no marker for fibromyalgia. So the doctor has no choice. He says, we did the blood test. There's nothing wrong with you. Therefore, it's in your head. It's just, you're just got a mental problem. And of course, we know we have fibro fog and we have mental problems, but that's not the problem for this. It's not the cause of it. And it's not the cause of it. I'm in pain constantly. I can't sleep constantly. I have this problem constantly. Well, your blood's fine, so it can't help you. And eventually they say, well, okay, here's a, here's a drug. Try it. And, of course, all we hear about is the problems people have on the drugs and the problems people have getting off of the drugs. I mean, it's worse than cocaine and heroin, I think, based on comments. That people like to, yeah, I'd like to pipe in here with something. Uh, you know, that the common drugs that are prescribed, there are some drugs that have been authorized to be prescribed for fibromyalgia by the FDA. So we have the Lyrica and uh, we have the Savella that are prescribed. And then another popular one is gabapentin. And each of them has different role, different approach, different different way to mess with your brain. Fibromyalgia is, uh, well, no, let me say this pain, there are two types of pain or definition of where pain is perceived. Some people perceive it in the brain. They say it's a perception problem. It's at the brain side. And the other is, no, it's at the receptor side. It's at the muscle, at the tissue side, right? So you have these two ends of where this pain could be originating. One is uh, you know, you hit yourself with a hammer on the finger, you know for sure that it's at the finger and the signal got to your brain. However, you could uh, focus yourself on something else. Like you could focus your mind on watching something that you're completely interested in and you could forget about the pain for a while. And I'm sure this happened to somebody or many of you, like you could have a toothache but you can start watching a movie and for the two hours or however long you're going to be fully enthralled and engaged in something else, you can forget about the tooth pain. And then it comes back when you return. And this is the sort of thing that you can do for yourself. You can learn how to manage your pain by being able to set it aside. We all have the ability to essentially renegotiate of how we perceive our existence. Um, I guess to to illustrate my own exercise, I can I can go to a dentist and uh, have all kinds of work done without the freezing because I'm able to essentially set my consciousness into another place rather than to just simply dwell on the pain that's being inflicted on me right at the moment. And this is the point where you can clearly say that, yes, the pain is in your head. It's all in your head. <laughs> How come you're not smiling, Scott? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where you're going with this. Well, where I'm going with this is this. Head, but I still feel it. Yeah, okay. A while back, 
when I was at my worst. I mean, I was in a lot of physical pain. Like I was in such a way that I would crawl on all fours. Like, you know, I would roll out of bed and crawl like a dog to the toilet. Then I would do my business. I would crawl back. I wouldn't go to bed. I would go into my rocking chair and lay face down because I couldn't lie flat on my back. You know, just so you can relate that, yes, I was in a miserable state of mind. But I uh, I discovered something. I think I have it here. Yes, I do. Here's a book. This is a book by John Sarno, Mind, Body, Prescription. After I read that, all of a sudden, just reading it made life better. And then doing the exercises that are in it made my life way more bearable. The way my pain was affecting me completely changed. So I would highly recommend it to people that they consider that at least to a large degree, the trauma that they're experiencing, the pain that they're experiencing. Um, okay, uh, somebody's asking, I'll interrupt. Somebody's asking if we can see the comments people are typing in. Absolutely, yes, we can see your comments. If you type something in, we see it. And in about 10 minutes, we're going to be opening up uh, the floor to questions and dealing with the questions. But, uh, but anyway, so-, so let me go back to the point I was trying to make, which is uh, we, we wrote a book about pain and chronic disease, and we call it the four pillars of health, or they should have been called the four gates to hell. Same deal. There are toxicity, malnutrition, stagnation, and trauma. And I have just been talking about trauma for the most part now, whether it's emotional from something that hurts you um, emotionally. It could be a a violent act taken against you or stuff you saw that you shouldn't see. These are people in war, first responders, witnessing accidents, and so on. It can really traumatize you or people in general. And then there's physical trauma. You can have physical trauma from a disease like high fever or something like that or or a car accident or whatnot. Um, a bullet wound, you know, any one thing can be the last straw that breaks the camel's back. And the camel here is the immune system. And when his back is broken, it's not enough to take the straw and all of the other packages that were on the back of the camel, because you still have a camel with a broken back. You need to actually heal and um, that's that's a complicated and lengthy process. But anyway, Scott, uh, what, what did you want to say? Well, you've been you've been talking a lot about the emotional side of it, and I think that's really important. And a lot of times, people in the in the group comment that uh, I had this big fight, or my boss is threatening to fire me, and now I have all these flares. And those are all, you know, part of the clues. Like you really need to look at how can I have a peaceful life because these emotional things that are happening are having a huge impact on our life. The other side of it, though, is is that we live in a very toxic environment, not just emotionally. I mean, watch if you're watching the news every night, you're getting traumatized secondhand as far as I'm concerned because you're seeing all of these events that are occurring around the world that are usually pretty horrific. Uh, but the other side of it is, is that generally speaking, we live in a world where we have um, non-food going into our mouth. Like we process the, all the good stuff out of our out of our food, and then we put it onto a into a can or into a plastic bag on a shelf where it can sit for six months to a year or five years before we actually get around to eating it. And there is no nutritional value in it. So one of the pillars that we talk about is malnutrition. You know, are you eating good food? And part of the problem, too, is is a lot of our food comes with its very own um, poisons. It's herbicides and pesticides that are used on the crops. And, of course, that gets into our water and it gets into our food and it gets into us. And the body doesn't know what to do about it. 
the other one that's really big is exercise, like being able to just, you know, get up and do some gentle exercise. You have to move your body because, you know, we talked about the third one is toxicity. One of the ways we get rid of toxins in our body is through our lymph system, which is kind of like our blood system, except that there's nothing beating. So what happens is, is that we need to move around so that the stuff in our lymph system actually gets moved around. And, um, you know, so there's these four things. And if you're not doing any of them or you're not only doing one of the three, four, then you're going to have some problems. Right. So you mentioned malnutrition, stagnation and toxicity. These three are essentially the illnesses of the modern times, the industrial life. We have created this industrial society. Uh, when you live somewhere in the third world as a hunter-gatherer, uh, eating food that's in the primal terrain, none of this happens. What what you have there is uh, a concern that when you eat food that has been grown on depleted soils, fertilized by chemicals, treated by herbicides and pesticides, you continue to pollute your body with toxic additives and you are getting food that's actually poor in nutrients you could have a lot of calories but not enough nutrition calorie rich nutrient poor which is actually one of the leading causes of eating too much because your body says feed me nutrition and you feed it calories and so at the end of the meal the body still thinks but we haven't really had enough nutrition So it wants more. So it wants more, screaming for, feed me. Uh, so the toxicity, these would be things like um, uh, the metallic uh, particles of the brake pads in the traffic. Every time somebody steps on the brakes, there's actually a wear on the discs or the drums and the pads, and it goes in the air. Or every time you burn coal, It's releasing mercury that's stored in the coal. In the United States alone, there are 50,000 tons of mercury released into the air. Yeah. Here's, here's a funny story. So we mine a whole lot of coal. We put it on a boat and we ship it to China. The Chinese burn it to generate the power to drive their factories to make the uh, wonderful T-shirts and uh, stuffed animals that they sell us for cheap. Anyway, the coal dust goes up in the air. The trade winds or whatever they're called. No, it's another Jetstream. word. Jetstream. Jetstream picks it up and um, it comes down into the ocean in the rain. Or it flies all the way to California, falls on the, on the fields. And so even if you're eating organic food, the rain that comes down is loaded with toxins. Yeah. That's the bad news. So we had a really good question, and I'm just going to show it from Morgan, which is, is there a special diet for fibromyalgia? And Morgan, I'm going to say yes and no. And I'm, I want to segue into our seven-day challenge. So if you go to the group's uh, description, you'll see that there's a link there to sign up for the seven-day challenge. It's seven days. You watch a video, and it tells you, don't eat this food for today. And then tonight and tomorrow, see if you feel better. And we kind of – we feel like we're cheating. Because really it takes three or four days or maybe a week of not eating bread and pastas to see if gluten is affecting you or not. Or cutting down on your sugars to see if that's affecting you or not. But we didn't want to have a 30-day challenge because we just felt that would be too overwhelming. But, you know, everyone says, well, I could go one day without Coca-Cola or uh, maybe one day without uh, flour or something like that. So the point of it is, is that everybody is unique and everybody needs to figure out their own diet. So the first thing we say is try to get as few pesticides and herbicides into your food as possible and as little processed food as possible, which means you go around the outside of the grocery store, you hit the, 
I'm going to say the bakery, <laughs> it's on the outside. You're going to hit the deli and the meat department and the produce department. And it's all basically kind of living or was living until fairly recently type stuff, as opposed to in the, in the shelving, in the aisles, in the center, where, you know, Cheerios can last for 10 years probably and no one would notice any difference. Or the, the oils that they have on the shelves should go rancid in less than a week and they're on there for six months. So that just tells you that there's not a lot of good nutrition there. So what we want you to do is eat food that's living food or was living very, you know, not long ago, like carrots and celery and that sort of lettuce. Um, if you can go organic, so much the better, right? And we want you to do it for one day and then see if there's a difference. And what usually happens is people comment, wow, I can't believe when I, didn't eat bread for a whole day, how much better I felt the next day or, or that evening even. Um, you know, so and then if you say, okay, I've noticed it for these food groups, then expand it. Once you've done the seven-day challenge and you, you've kept track of everything, say, okay, I'm not going to eat this type of food for a week and then see how you feel. And it's kind of like one of the things Martin says that I think is just a great saying is when you find yourself in a deep hole, stop digging. And unfortunately, what might cause a problem for you could be very different than what causes a problem for me because we're all individuals. There's not a silver bullet that's going to cure everybody of fibromyalgia. Everybody has their own in unique environment, their own unique genetics, their own unique eating styles, what they've ate in the past and everything else. So you need to really start being aware of what you're doing on a daily basis and then how that impacts you. If I have a slice of bread at noon, at 2.30, like in seven minutes, you'll notice I'll be sleeping. <laughs> That's what happens with me, right? I just, be, I become very alkaline. When you become very alkaline, you're, you're not raging or mad or anything. Like you're the opposite, which is get on the couch and have a nap, right? And if, but if you eat a slice of bread and then you go out and you're just yelling and screaming at the, all the other car drivers and cutting them off and impatient and everything else, you've got that road rage going on, you're acidic and you need to eat something that's going to take you down. So when I get really, really mad, I have a slice of bread and it, it calms me that right down because it makes me less acidic, makes me more alkaline. And so there's not, well, that's why I, there's not a specific diet for fibromyalgia. What I, what I wanted to say is this. The seven-day challenge was my gift to humanity in this manner. We offer advanced metabolic typing tests. You can take a shortcut. It's 120 questions, through multiple choice. Uh, when you answer that, and it's an online quiz, and it's not free, you pay for that. When you do that, we can give you the answers directly. But you can also figure out these answers all to yourself. Right. Okay, Stacy, we are not advertising. I get pissed off when some idiots like that start giving me idiotic points like they're just advertising and selling books. I gave you that information for free, so stop being a dick. How's that? Yeah, that's a little acidic. Exactly. Because I'm just so pissed off at getting pissed on by people who have no business doing that. So Morgan asks, how much is the test? Okay, we charge $97. It's, um, it includes an hour of coaching afterwards. Anyway, you will, you will know your type. As, as in, anyway, I gave away for free the information how you can do your own if you want to figure it out for yourself. So Jamie asks, I want to see the book again. So we're going to oh, put a... <laughs> I'll put in the link too, but here's the book. My book body. again. Okay. But anyway, so the, the point of that conversation was that you get to figure out your own metabolic type if you want and understand. Here, here's the theory of it. You need to understand that there are two main body systems. One type is alkalized by fats and proteins, and the other type is acidified by them. The conversion or inversion of that 
The other type is alkalized by carbohydrates and acidified by fats and proteins. I can give you technical terms for it and all of that. I can start telling you about oxidizers and autonomics and sympathetics and parasympathetics and all of that. But the point of that is that not everybody will react the same way. You may be alkalized by fats and proteins and the person next to you acidified by it. So you need to know for yourself. And that's what we were teaching in the first four days of the seven-day challenge, for you to figure out for yourself how you need to eat in order to manage your mind states. Cool. All right. So this has come up a couple times, so I want to address it. Do you think fibro causes depression or does depression cause fibro? Thank you for your help today. Thank you, Samantha. And I want to start off by saying yes and yes. Uh, it's quite possible that, uh, first of all, if you are in a really bad situation, depression is a normal response, right? So if I'm in pain all the time, like I would think that depression would be a normal response to being in pain all the time. Uh, however, if I get depressed, that could cause flares in my fibro. So the key is, is to understand how your environment and how what you put in your mouth affects you first, because that's the biggest thing, right? Like if you put the wrong food in your mouth, you're going to have worse time with fibro than if you put the right food in your mouth. Uh, you know, that goes back to Plato, you know, your food is your medicine, your medicine is your food. And uh, right now we're putting toxic stuff in our mouths. If you're drinking Coca-Cola and eating old Dutch chips and having hot dogs and blah, 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 you know, all the stuff that people normally eat, then it's not surprising to anybody except the person who's sick that they're sick. You know, you look at people who are diabetic and the doctor says, well, you're obese, you're eating too much sugar. Of course, you're, you're going to be diabetic. Everybody that weighs what you weigh and eats as much sugar as you is diabetic. So like, stop eating so much sugar and lose weight, right? Uh, but we don't look at that. We want to have the pill. And so that's, I think, you know, that's, a, that's what I really want to address on that is yes and yes. Well, I want to tell you that the following. Fibromyalgia is a symptom and depression is a symptom. They both are in parallel. They both are symptoms of an inflammatory change in the body. Depression specifically is associated with being overly alkaline. Like when you are just mildly alkaline, you will be procrastinating. Then you get despondent and, and you won't want to get out of bed and you will be really hard to get out of bed before noon. And before you know it, you want to keep the curtains closed for 24-7 and, uh, and depression sets in. That's the sort of physiological transition you can also get depression for from other physiological chemical toxic reasons but there is a nutritional component to it so if you're overly alkalized figure out whether it's carbohydrates or fats and proteins that do it and do less of what makes you more depressed and more of what makes you less depressed As hey scott so wanna... Scott noted just a moment ago that that was awfully acidic of me when I just simply laid it on. That was exactly a perfect example of what an overly acidic person acts like. Just short-tempered, pissy, disagreeable, just no social graces. So now we have a new coping mechanism, right? When we're talking with people in life, uh, you know, outside of this, when we're talking and commenting on posts in the group, and somebody is short-tempered and pissy, you can say, ah, Scott and Martin warned me about people like you. You're just too acidic. Like you need to eat a banana or have a slice of bread if you're this type, or you need to have a steak if you're that type, and, and get a little more alkaline. Okay, a brilliant question pops up, and it says, uh, so do you recommend apple cider vinegar? So apple cider vinegar is acidic and it's high potassium. So if you are the body type that needs more magnesium and potassium to calm down, then it's brilliant. 
So that works for me, for instance, for these short-tempered, pissy, acidic people. Um, magnesium and potassium are calming. But if you already are somewhat depressed or already calm, getting more of that is totally counterproductive. There really is not one single answer to any single problem. There are multiple answers, and you need to understand which one, which direction, and so on. Right. Anyway, you were I saying. wanted to jump in on the, the apple cider vinegar, too, because I was reading somewhere, oh, it's really good for this, this, this. So I bought a bottle, organic apple cider vinegar, had a teaspoon, tasted it, couldn't stand it, and it... And I don't want it. Like my, like I listen. I've learned to listen to my body, and it's saying like, no, you don't want to eat this. And now I understand why, because my struggle is to be more acidic, because I get too alkaline. If Martin's the snippy, snappy guy, I'm the one that you know just gets despondent and procrastinates, and so you know, down, 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 until I don't want to get out of bed. So I need to to go the opposite way, and. <laughs> So uh, somebody else had just, there was a question just up there. If I can bring it up, I'm going to, which was about vegans and meat. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. What about vegetarians and so on? So right. here goes, here goes, right? If you could visualize that. The our... I wish my friend could hear this. She's on a juicing kick and has gone over vegan. And because I eat an ounce of meat with rice and salad, she tells me my diet sucks and I can cure fibromyalgia just doing what she does. So first of all, no, you can't because you are both two totally individual people and you could be opposites, right? Like okay. what, what affects you want to illustrate. So visualize four corners of a piece of paper. Here, these people are overly alkaline. Here, the people are overly acidic, overly acidic, overly alkaline. But these two are corrected Hold by high protein. These two, these two corners would be corrected by high protein. These two corners would be corrected by high carbohydrate. So if it just so happens that you're over here and you're acidic and your correction is low fat, high carbohydrate, then the juicing and the vegan is the most wonderful thing. It'll calm you down. It'll center you. It'll make your life just beautiful. But if you find yourself already on the other side of it, as in needing high fat, high protein, you're just going to make yourself terribly ill. And so there are people who can try to go vegan, vegetarian, and they can so-so almost manage. And then they start eating at least some animal proteins and, oh boy, do they ever start feeling better. And... Uh, I think I got lost halfway through the question, but the point is that it's great for some people to, to go juicing and vegan and whatever. Here is the point. Up to about 500 years ago, our ancestors lived mainly in a single confined area and ate the foods that were in that particular local resource. So if your great, great, great grandparents lived somewhere in North Africa or Mediterranean, they lived on dates, figs, pomegranates, camel milk, and they can eat all the sugar and carbs you can imagine and be just fine. But if your great, great granny is Norwegian, they lived on salmon and reindeer, and they lived in cold, cold days where no vegetables, no fruit were available for six months out of the year. There's no way that you can be a successful vegetarian with that heritage. Right. So Angela had a great question. How do we find out which way we are? In order to figure out your metabolic typing, what we recommend you do to begin with is take the seven-day challenge because that's not going to tell you which way you are, but it's going to start giving you clues. Then we have a metabolic typing test, which we'd mentioned earlier. And uh, when we get off of here in the in the group uh, comment section and also on the event page or wherever I can find this video, because I don't know where Facebook puts it, I will put a link to the metabolic typing page. It is on www.life-enthusiast.com. You can go there. There's a phone number and an email. You can call Martin. He'll answer the phone. 
or his beautiful wife Maureen will answer the phone and they can tell you exactly where to uh, where to get the metabolic typing if you uh, if you want to try it out. I think it's a really important uh, mm -hmm. thing. So here's a great, great follow up question. That's it. I would like to answer that. So well, let's uh, ask the question. The reason I read the question is I do make an audio version of this, so I want the people not to wonder like what was the question. So do you think I should do a DNA uh, experiment to find out my heritage? Right. So there is this wonderful company called 23andMe, and there probably are others that can give you your full genetic profile. I had mine done, so I know what my genetics are, and I can tell you what particular malformations or mutations are in there that cause me to be this way or that way. And some of them they get right, like they told me that I should have brown eyes, but mine are blue. Uh, others, they were right. So anyway, um, the point I'm trying to make is this. When you know your exact full profile, it will only tell you what you were born with. Uh, there's genetics and there's epigenetics. Epigenetics is the what does your environment and your current situation turn on. Every gene can be activated or inactivated. And the activation can be for the good or for the worse. And chemicals and poisoning and bad food and blah, 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 all of that, that makes things worse. And living the organic, the clean life, the meditate every day, do some stretching and a bit of exercise and carry 20 pounds of water around for six hours a day, you know, that sort of old primitive life, that's good for us. So when you do the right things, you get a lot healthier as opposed to when you do the opposite. The industrial lifestyle isn't that wonderful for our health. All right. So this is also available in the UK, so no problem. Now, we have a question from uh, George, and he's been asking this one for a, a while. Jorge. Uh, Jorge. So I'd like to know the difference between CBD and hemp oils for the pain. Also confused about the laws regarding these oils. Some people have. There's been some talk about it being illegal, being turned into a Schedule 1 on Christmas Eve or something like that right. cool and, uh, okay let's jump straight from uh, general into highly specific but what the heck why not so in your body there's this cannabido cannabinoid system which has its receptors cb1 cb2 receptors essentially uh, something like this the histamine i talked about is the pain signaling system the cannabino cannabinoid is the pleasure signaling system. And they're in opposition to one another. And the hemp, the plant called hemp, which in uh, Latin is called cannabis and in Spanish is called marijuana, it's the same plant, but it has been um, cultivated in various forms. Uh, growers have cultivated it for uh, industrial purposes and others for entertainment purposes. And the THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid, is the stuff that makes you high. Cannabidiol is the other highly available alkaloid that has completely different properties. It's calming, it's healing, it's centering, it's anti-inflammatory. So when you access the hemp that is grown for the entertainment, for the high, it usually is quite high in THC and quite low in CBD. The industrial hemp, on the other hand, is very low in THC and high in CBD. So when you end up smoking the street, street hemp, you could cause yourself a flare of anxiety because many people react to the THC with a complete anxiety response. So, yeah, here this we is actually this is actually what uh, Jamie said. She tried smoking and it made my pain worse. And you just yeah, told her why. Yeah, it could give you a full on psychotic attack. But anyway, so going back to the legalities of it. So back uh, sometimes in the 30s, North America has decided to 
made hemp illegal. There was no good reason for it other than industrial interests. The uh, paper magnets and, and nylon manufacturers got together and convinced the Congress that they should just uh, made this thing illegal. Anyway, it's illegal. But industrial hemp is exempted from this illegal status. So it's, it's a funny legalistic loophole, but it works. So here, as we are, we're able to ship you products that have been extracted from the industrial hemp because it's the industrial hemp. We could not ship you product that was grown in the United States and is a whole hemp. That is, that is regulated by a completely different system, like, for instance, California and a few other states where you can buy medical marijuana, which is the whole hemp plant. What we have in so our what website you're is the, the oils like this one, for example. Yeah, what we have in our website, like here's an example of what we put in a bottle. That's actually hemp seed oil, or this one is actually nectar, which means it's glycerin, that has the extract from the hemp added to it. Now this, now, this is extract. from the stock of the hemp. This isn't from the bud that people smoke. Right. And here's a question that pops up. What's the percentage in the bottle? And that's the other silly question that causes a lot of misunderstandings. It's sort of like asking, what's the percentage of alcohol in your wine? It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's 12. We can, we can tell you. But the point is that how much wine does it take to get you drunk? In in this, how many milligrams of CBD does it take to get you out of pain? Right. So D made a really good comment that fits in with what we've been saying, and that's very true. Smoking, it gives me extreme anxiety. Consuming, it works somewhat better, however. But I found that CBD tried it. It does calm, but it doesn't work for pain, it's, and it is very expensive. I don't know about expensive. Um, we have um, most people get by on twenty to thirty dollars a month. Uh, when you compare that to the common OxyContin bill, I think it's just fine. Right. Um, anyway, somebody asked, uh, oh, "What was the question?" Oh, comparing seed and bud and stock. So there is such a thing as hemp seed oil. The seeds contain very little of the cannabidiol. So when you press the seeds, the hemp seed oil is a lot like olive oil or flax oil or any other seed oil that you would use in your kitchen for cooking. Uh, Canada is a special case. In Canada, they have legislated explicitly that everything about hemp is controlled substance, except for the hemp oil. So when we ship products to Canada, we ship you hemp oil. If it does or doesn't have CBD, nobody knows and nobody asks. So the hemp oil is still being shipped to all 50 states in the United States, to Canada, to Australia, to the UK. And we're uh, shipping it because we're shipping you hemp seed oil or coconut oil with a trace of uh, CBD. So the question about the percentages, what you really need to know is how much by weight. What's the absolute number? Like, is there 100 milligram or 300 milligram or 500 or 1,000 milligram in this package that you buy? Because the the real dose or the needed dose is about one to two milligrams at a time. So if you're vaping it or if you're putting it in your mouth or if you're eating it as um, capsules or, or foods and spreads or whatever, it takes a few drops to get you about one to two milligrams. And you do that several times a day. And it, you just learn to ride the wave. It's sort of like being thirsty, right? You're thirsty, you drink, you're not thirsty. After a while, especially if you're sweating a lot, you need to take another drink. And that's what you do. All right. So we had a, a good question. Is the industrial hemp CBD oils, do they have artificial chemicals that could affect our body? Great wow. question. Okay. Excellent question. So because we're having to import this hemp, uh, again, because of the leg legislative loopholes, we're bringing it 
from Europe. We could be bringing it from China, but we don't. The products that we sell is uh, grown in Europe. And in Europe, they actually have, in all of the EU, they have this particular regulation about hemp. It has to be grown organically. No chemicals allowed, period. The fields are controlled. Like you report to the authorities, you tell them that you're growing hemp. It's in a known area and you're not allowed to put chemicals on it. So automatically, all European hemp is free of herbicides or pesticides. Now, the next question is, how do they extract it? All of this is a, um, it's an essential oil. You know, the same way that you would uh, get yourself uh, lavender oil out of the lavender plant or the elang elang oil from the uh, elang plant, you get yourself this cannabidiol or cannabis oil from the body of the hemp plant. And to get it, you need to do an organic solvent extraction. And the available organic solvents include alcohol, butane, hexane, uh, naphtha, and carbon dioxide. And each one of those solvents will extract a different fraction. So the two most popular ones have been carbon dioxide and alcohol, and we have both. We also know of people who do butane extraction, especially for the entertainment cannabis that people want to get high on. So if you're interested in finding out more, our website is www.remarkablerecovery.com. You can see all the different varieties of uh, hemp oils. There, I think there's seven manufacturers that we work with, and there's all different types. I mean, this one that I was showing is uh, 250, 250 yeah, milligrams. 250 glycerin, yeah. <clears throat> but there's all different sizes. And I think that, you know, we talked before about what you eat and whether you should be vegetarian or eating meat or carbs or not carbs and all the rest of it and how it's individualized. And I think it's pretty much the same with the hemp oil. And what I would recommend, it's beyond the scope of us to talk about it specifically here because we're talking to the world. But on the site is Martin's uh, phone number. Give him a call. He can go through with, you know, find out, first of all, where you're at what sort of pain levels you're at and, and what you're doing, and then give you some really good advice on which one to get if, if that's what you wanted to do. Right. And, and the question I, about what's the highest percentage, again, I can get it to you at 98% pure in powder, in crystal, but it's unusable in that form in the same way as pure alcohol is not usable for entertainment purposes. And this isn't the silver bullet either, by the way. You know, we talked about the four. We're going to go back to the beginning for those of you that just joined us. We talked about the four pillars of health, which was, uh, you know, mount, four gateways to health. Like, we call them the pillars to health, but they're not. Like, if you do this, you're in worse trouble than you are now. But it's malnutrition. It's stagnation, not moving, not exercising. Uh, and now toxicity. toxicity, which is just our and environment, wrong. what we're breathing. And then there's the emotional drama and the spiritual uh, problems that that and all the invisible things like EMF frequencies that are running through because of cell phones and cell towers and all those things they affect us. We're in this invisible soup. So the the hemp oil. There was somebody who commented a couple of days ago in the group that they did something and they just feel. One, I think it was they started a new medicine and they just felt great. And I thought, you know, you feel great. So start making all those changes that you didn't make before in your life because you yeah. can do it now because you don't feel miserable. But I know it's like, I feel great. I'm going to go and have a beer and dance all night. No, no. <laughs> you know, you need to look at your diet. You need to look at your exercise regimens. You need to look at, you know, how yeah. many these you've got in your house and that sort of stuff. If you're beside high voltage wires and you've got to look at, you know, the toxicity that you've got in your system right and yeah. there's a lot of things like zeolite and humic and fulvic acid that can really help pull toxins out we don't really have time to talk about all that this time we'll, well talk let me just another. let me just uh ask you this other uh, to, to to riff on that when you're saying um when you buy yourself some time when you're feeling good 
don't waste it on partying. Waste it. Don't, don't waste it. Use it to get yourself better. Like I don't condemn anyone for taking painkillers, OxyContin included, when you're needing to buy yourself some peace and time. But please use that time wisely and use it to figure out how you can get better by researching the causes that get you into the hole. Right. Because if you stay yeah, yeah, if you stay on the painkillers, they are actually making you toxic, more toxic as you go. And because your problem is caused by high level of toxicity, you're actually going to again reach a level, a threshold when you're going to get worse. We like to use the car analogy. When you're driving your car and your engine light pops up, you know, the little engine light, and it's like, ah, oh, you know, I've got a problem with my engine. And maybe you throw a quart of oil in and the light goes away for a while, and then it comes on again. So then you take some gum and you put it over the light so you can't see it, and you're driving and everything is fine. And then what happens one day is the car stops. And it's like, well, I don't know why it stopped. Well, you ignored the warning signals. So you have these huge warning signals. I'm in pain. You do something like take a, take some medication that your doctor gives you. You're not in pain. That doesn't mean you fixed it. That just means you're not in pain. So now you have an opportunity to work on the four pillars of health, to get good nutrition into your body, to, to start walking and exercising some more, to get the third one, which for some reason today I can't remember for the life of me. And then to, you know, make sure you've got rid of all the drama, toxins, and get rid of all the drama in your life, right? So yeah. we've got like eight minutes left. Okay, and, well, let me answer one more thing then. Well, I wanted to bring up George's question. It's huge. <laughs> I'm sorry for this other question, but I think I've been watching too much of Cops, a TV show. But I remember that they said that, they, that the regular mail is always monitored by the DEA, and if a product complying with Comping with uh, marijuana kind of is could be illegal, even if this one is coming from a place where it is legal. For consequence, the person that ordered that product could be arrested. But if I buy it from you, what is the information that I need to know in order to, to be okay. safe of law enforcement? Just feel confident in buying it. Thank you. Great question. Okay, Jorge, this is a smart question. The thing is that we're not sending you marijuana. We are not even sending you hemp. We're sending you a bottle of salad oil with some alkaloids in it. And it so turns out that these alkaloids are imported into the United States under legal status and are distributed within the United States legally. So all of those questions you have, they completely uh, center on marijuana. We don't ship that. That's not part of the product. So we had a conversation, Martin and I, with some of the other manufacturers. By the way, we have a YouTube channel, Life Enthusiast, uh, on YouTube, and we have interviewed most of the manufacturers of the hemp oils that we use. So they're great to really get a feel for the, really the love and the concern that these manufacturers have for the hemp. And uh, But one of the conversations Martin and I had, and I want to share this, was if we were in, uh, say, Missouri, and we got a bunch of this hemp product and we crushed it all up extracted the oil and we tried to sell it to you down the road that actually would probably be illegal because we can't do it in this is how strange the law is but we can have it all done in europe for example and import it and it's fine and is there any difference no but this is the way the law is is set yeah. up okay so let me answer the fatigue question there are people who would like to be Okay, I'll answer this question before I finish. Highest percentage CBD. I can sell you, if you want it, 98% crystalline CBD. But I won't really want to sell it because it's stupid. What you want is something that is consumable. More concentrated isn't better. Uh, one shot of vodka equals 12 ounces of beer. Get that? They get you equally drunk. So whether you take 10 drops of 100 mg or one drop of 1,000 mg out of the bottle of one ounce of this solution, you get equal amount. The dosage is get one to two milligrams of CBD per serving three to five times a day. So that's anywhere between five and 10 milligrams or three and 10 milligrams a day. Okay? 
That's it. Okay. Anyway, the fatigue, okay? Here's the fatigue. Is there anything you can do for fatigue? I have three children, so when in pain, I can't take painkillers. But when you're so tired, it's hard work. You push and push yourself when you're just so tired. Right. So it's one of the common reasons that we feel tired is because the conversion of food into energy is impaired. This is related to the genetic heritage. This uh, MTHFR gene mutation is fairly common. Uh, 30% of Americans have both parents with that. 70% uh, yeah, have at least one parent with it. So what happens is this. You need to find some way to methylate better. Now, methyl, that's CH3. You can either try and fix your liver and improve uh, things like glycation and da, 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 whatever, but there's a shortcut. Methyl sulfonyl methane, also known as MSM. We sell that. We can provide you a link to it. We have discussed it many times in the group. It's called bioavailable sulfur. It's the MSM. You take that, but you need to take enough of it. So in this case, it's probably two teaspoons a day. When you take that, your world changes. All of a sudden, you have enough methyl ions in circulation, and your food-to-energy conversion improves, and, uh, and uh, fatigue goes away. There was another question that related to it, which was, uh, oxygen, right? If you push oxygen, yes, this is this is um, inside your cells, mitochondria. Mitochondria are the little furnace that converts the glucose in presence of oxygen into usable energy. In order to get the oxygen across the cellular membrane, you need to have the sulfur that helps you with that transit. So with enough sulfur on board, you can move the oxygen across the cell membrane. You get it inside the cell so the glucose can burn and uh, more energy dance with the children. You also may be the person that needs more potassium. You also may be the person that does not. I don't know. Call me and we'll work it out. Okay. Multiple sclerosis pops up. Wait. Well, we have one first before that. I just had one question. If you have smoked marijuana and it caused you pain, would that, would what you're suggesting for pain cause the same side effects? Well, if you do the CBD only, there's a high chance that you will not experience the anxiety and pain that you experience on full body hemp. <sighs> Multiple sclerosis is yet another chronic inflammatory histamine-mediated disorder. It shares the causes with fibromyalgia. Toxicity, trauma, um, especially mercury heavy metals are at the root of both. So when we treat one or the other, we get an improvement in symptoms. So... Detox, heavy metal detox. Scott mentioned zeolite a while ago. I mean, there's just no way we can tell you everything in one hour. Right. So we might do this again. Yeah. Especially well, and that's the thing too, is in the group, well, there's a couple of things I want to ask everybody to do. If you, a lot of people have said, you know, thank you very much. I really appreciate the information you're sharing. And we appreciate that feedback. Would really appreciate it if you would share in the group some of the insights that you got, some of the, your thoughts about the, the live for everybody else. And of course, the video will be a replay video so you can review it and anyone that missed it can see it. And then any questions that you've got, and oftentimes we just go and look at the group and see what everyone's talking about and pick some of those. Uh, but, you know, ask us specifically. And next week when we do this again, we'll, uh, we'll, you know, we'll talk about that. I think we had a really good question about leaky gut. So, and I think that's a really important issue in terms of general health and fibromyalgia. So maybe next time, Martin, we can talk about that in, in more depth, but we would really appreciate, we appreciate, you know, the supporting you. And we also appreciate the support that you give us. It's a two-way street. And by liking it or commenting it or telling people, you know what, this Martin and Scott talked about what you were just asking in the video yesterday or whenever it was. And, uh, 
go here and look, look watch it would be would be just wonderful because we want to get we were happy we had 34 35 people watching but we really there's 35 40,000 people in the group we want to get uh, we want to get more people uh, paying attention to these uh, right and so topics. somebody asked is is this you know my psoriasis da, 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 my rheumatoid arthritis and so on every I need answers. Yes, we do have the answers, honestly, Nikki. But anyway, so psoriasis, again, it's just another uh, puppy from the same litter. It has uh, primarily uh, issues with gut, leaky gut, uh, microbiome issues that cause uh, liver congestion, which then in turn cause skin issues and so on. So just like multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma or Sjogren's and Hashimoto's and, and vitiligo, and uh, I could probably go for 20 minutes with names of things. You see, doctors name things by the body part that's affected. They don't ask the question, but what caused it? But that's what we're telling you is if you want to get better instead of managing your symptoms, then you need to look after the causes, not the symptoms. <laughs> Nikki just tuned out. Okay, Nikki, go back to the beginning and watch it. Right. Jorge said, not sure if you mentioned already, but did you say you provide any time for coaching or consultation? If yes, how much do you charge and would, what will it be covered? Also, would you please advise a little bit more about MS, my girlfriend has it and she's listening. Okay. So I am available as a health coach at Life Enthusiast, life-enthusiast.com. Phone number 866 543 3388. I'm willing to give any one person a consultation free one time. If you're a customer of ours and you're buying things, that's the only way we get paid. And we do appreciate your patronage. Uh, so if you are a customer, I'm not going to charge you for the support and you call again. If you want to simply just take the time and ask questions, then the rate is $120 an hour or $2 a minute. Cool. All right. So we want to thank you all for joining us. We've come kind of to the end of our time. We want to just kind of keep it to one hour and really appreciate uh, you joining us. And we really appreciate your questions and your participation. And uh, our goal is to do this on a weekly basis. It, it'll probably be, uh, no, we're going to try week. and have it the same time every week, except that I'm doing a fair bit of traveling every once in a while. So if it's a travel day, we'll just move it, you know, to the day. Um, let's, let's do it in different times for different time zones. It's okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so if there's a time that you would prefer, <laughs> Nikki says, no, no, go. <laughs> if there's okay. a time you would prefer, just put it in the comments so that we know and we'll try and hit that time as long as it's not four in the morning here. Put in, put in a date and time when you want the next one to be. And also put in the questions. We will read it. And um, and this don't go request. Look, you can watch it from the beginning, and <laughs> and if you really need help, then call. I just told you how you can get hold of us. Yes, it it actually is on the page, and it's also in the events page. But uh, once I have, what I do with these videos is I edit them slightly, put them up on our YouTube channel. And I make them into a podcast. So you'll be able to listen to them on your iPhone or your Android if you wanted to. And you could watch it on YouTube if you wanted to instead of in the group. So it'll be in all sort of three places. Once I make the version that I put on YouTube, I also post it a second time to the group. So you'll, uh, you'll have a chance to see it that second time. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate your participation. Uh, this feel, is your, feel your pain. I just want you to know that I have been, and Scott has been, we both have had our own stories of utter despair, you know, close to either dying or wanting to. Uh, we are not strangers to suicidal thoughts. We understand how shitty it can get. 
but <clears throat> I just want to tell you that you can live a decent life, but not on pharmaceutical pills. That I guarantee you is not a successful strategy. Or processed food that's like cardboard. Good tasting oh. cardboard, but cardboard. That's, that's my big thing. I'm absolutely convinced the only reason I'm here is because of the Exla brand of superfoods. But that's a story for, for another day. Another story. Um, and and when somebody story. tells me, oh, yeah, one more thing. And when somebody tells me that I'm selling too much, try it again. I'm coming to get you, punk. <laughs> He's still acidic. <laughs> So this is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Love you lots. Bye-bye.